Let's all stand this morning and let's take our Bibles and turn over to 1 John, 1 John chapter 4. And I'm going to preach about something today that God gave me this weekend. And I'm so appreciative whenever he speaks to me. We're going to um, start at chapter 4 of 1 John and then read starting at verse 12. This is the Apostle John. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. That's all you got to do. You want to be perfect? Walk in love. By this we know that we abide in him. You want to know if you are truly a Christian? I do. And he in us because he has given us his spirit. We know that we abide in him. And he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides him in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Oh, it's so important. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in God, but perfect love. Somebody say perfect love. Cast out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Let's bow. Father, I thank you for this word, and I thank you how you spoke this into me on Friday night. I thank you how you perfected it along the way, Lord, on Saturday. I thank you for this morning and the continuation of that. And so now, Lord, I'm just going to be obedient and faithful and walk in faith and love and preach this just as you gave it to me. But now, Lord, I pray for every hearer, for whosoever has ears in this house today, they would hear this word gladly, receive it, allow it to be applied in each and every life so that we may be perfect in love. We ask these things, Lord, and far more in the precious name of Jesus and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Well, I tell you what, this week has been an amazing week. As I said, the prayer uh, noon meeting on Wednesday was just extraordinary for those who were there. The Thursday night national day of prayer, I hope that you that were there, I hope you experienced some of the things that I experienced that night. But I can tell you, if you didn't, just know by faith God was in the house God was hearing those heartfelt prayers for our nation. There's been that, but there's just been one thing after another. Brother James, certainly the way Nancy and I have taken Sister Robin into our heart this week, just day and night, waking up in the middle of the night and thinking about her and praying for her. Our heart has been so um, affected by what you and your family are going through. I've been going deeper and deeper, Brother Philip. Deeper, I believe, than I've ever been before. 
You know, I started out searching out on Friday, I started searching out the subject of mercy. And that morphed from one thing into the other. It went on to grace. It went on to perfection and righteousness, love and power and judgment. Some of those very deep things of God, I won't call them theology, I'll just call them the deep subjects of God's Word. It reminded me of a song that we would sing as a child. This book right here was given to me this is the church hymnal. It was given to me on my 60th birthday celebration. Uh, five today, it would be five years and eight months ago today. Today's the 11th, right? Ninth. 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 All right, so it'll be Tuesday. <laughs> we'll be five years and eight months. This was given to me as a gift that day by some folks who knew my background who had actually been, also experienced my denominational background and knew that this was the hymnal that we sang in every church that Nancy and I ever attended. And we knew so many of these songs by heart. If you would ask, throw out a song, I could tell you what page it was on. That's how familiar we were there was one in particular that we would sing, and, and perhaps there might be one or two here that also sang this church, uh, this song in your church. It was called Deeper, Deeper. Does anybody ever do that song in your church? It's deeper, Deeper. Well, I want to sing a, a verse and maybe a chorus here for you of what we sang Deeper, deeper at the love of Jesus daily let me go. Higher, higher in the school of wisdom, more of grace to know. Oh, deeper yet I pray. And higher every day, and wiser, blessed Lord, in the precious Holy Word. Yeah. There are six verses. I will spare you the other five. But I've been thinking about that song deeper. Deeper, because that's what's been going on in me, is a deeper, more satisfying walk with God over the last few months. Yes. And I'm so thankful. There's been some really tremendous things happening to me. As I got in bed Friday night, and Nancy joined me a, a few minutes later. I'm lying in bed there before Nancy came to bed. Nancy and I, probably a thousand times, we've looked at each other, and we would ask each other, what time of day is it? And we would both chorus, the best time of the day. We love climbing in bed, getting under those warm covers, we read, we have books that we read. I've got a stack of books this high waiting to be read. And uh, I, I've read uh, hundreds, thousands of books, I would think, over the years. And Nancy has read just as many or more. And so I'm laying there, and before I open my book, God speaks to me. And it strikes me so odd because he brings me to a scripture that I've looked over many times, I've preached about, but I've never really understood. And God spoke that into me, and it was out of this text I read to you this morning. 
that there is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear, because fear involves torment, but he who fears, fears has not been made perfect in love. And when God sold that verse into me, Sister Mary Jo, I thought, what's that all about? God, why now? Why that scripture out of the blue? Because I had started the morning, Friday morning, I had started it in mercy. I would just been studying and searching and researching mercy, and I, I was surprised when he gave me that scripture out of 1 John. And I said, God, what is this all about? What are you trying to speak to me? What are you trying to tell me? And as Nancy came to bed, I said, Honey, what do you think about the scripture in verse 18? that talks about that there is no fear in love and that perfect love cast out fear. And she began to tell me what she believed it was, and it, it made sense to me. It made sense to me. I began to understand it in a better way. And I, I did not forget that the next day as I as I went to God and I started just digging deeper and deeper and God, as he did so, he began to morph this even more. I started in mercy. I went to perfect love. And then before I knew it, sometime yesterday afternoon, I realized that this message was heading to a Mother's Day message. I had no intention of preaching a Mother's Day message here today, but God morphed it into that for his own purposes because I was asked the question, what, humanly speaking, is the closest thing to perfect love? And, of course, that is the love of a mother. The love of a mother. When I was a little guy, probably only about four years old, and I still remember this, we were at the great General Assembly in Cleveland, Tennessee, and, you know, 10, 20,000 people would gather from all over the world. And I was there in that city with my family, and somehow I got displaced from them. I got lost. And I'm walking around that city, just a little guy like that, no mommy, no daddy, no family, no one looks familiar. I don't know if I was crying, but obviously it was apparent that I was, that I was lost. And I don't know how I ended up in their hands, but I ended up in the hands of a fireman. And I must have been crying. I was very upset. And he said, how would you like to get up on the fire engine? and ride the fire engine. And boy, that perked me right up. I forgot about my problems, and I said, yes, I would. And they put me up on top of that fire engine. And I don't know if it's because I was 10 feet up in the air that my parents saw me in that crowd, but they came back to me. But I tell you, when I saw my mother, all was well again. Uh, a few years later, I was probably only about seven or eight years old, and the youth of our church decided we were going to ride our bicycles all over Detroit in some of the, what I would call the worst, poorest areas, most dangerous areas of Detroit. We were going to go out and hand tracks from house to house, and I was just a little guy, and I had a no-good bicycle with hard tires on it, could hardly could hardly even pedal the thing. It was so difficult, and I got left behind. And there I am in Detroit, all by myself, and I'm lost, and there's no familiar faces, and people are looking at me. Finally, I don't know how it is. I know I didn't find my way back home because I was completely lost where I was, but somehow they found me, and they brought me back, and when I seen my mama, Brother Ron, Everything was going to be all right at that point. The love of a mother. You see, my mother maybe wasn't so much a traditional mother like uh, some of you had. And if you had a good, loving, godly mother, 
Uh, you need to be very appreciative of that. My mother was not one to hug us as children. My three sisters and I, when we get together and talk about it, none of us remember ever being hugged. None of us ever remember ever being kissed. None of us ever remember either, uh, certainly my mother, ever saying to us that she loved us. But to the four of us, I can assure you, every single one of us know we were loved by our mother. Because not of what she said or the fact that she hugged us and kissed us, but because she showed that love to us. When I would be sick, and sometimes I would be very, very sick, burning up with fever and all kinds of things, I remember so clearly my mother putting anointed cloths up under my pillow and getting cold cloths and presses and putting them on my head. She would be there through the day, through the evening, through the night. My mother would nurse me and pray for me until the Lord would come and heal me. I remember that love that mom showed me, and it was the love of God. I remember, too, I just want to give a tribute to my own mother this morning and to yours and to all the mothers that are here. Brother Ron, when I was 16 years old, my mother and I were alone. My dad had gone off the rails and had left us and left the state. And it was just my mother and me. I was 16 years old and we were living in a single wide trailer in a trailer park. And one day, my mother, who had to go back to work at a factory, at a, at a heavy working furniture factory there in Pulaski, Virginia. And she would travel at least an hour back and forth to get to that job. She was not a very strong person to begin with. She was about your size at that time, Mary Jo, maybe a little taller. And uh, I got up one morning to go to school. My mother was still in bed. She had not gotten up. And I went, I said, Mom, why aren't you, why aren't you up and out? She said, I'm, I'm really suffering, Doyle. I'm really having some chest pains. And so I was just beside myself. It's just me. And so I, I got in my car and I drove down the road about an hour to where one of the other sisters of the church was, Sister Dot Williams. And her son, Mike, was my best friend. And I, went, I said, I, don't, I was crying. I said, I don't know what's going on. I said, but my mother is very sick. And so we came back together, and we called the pastor in, and we prayed. And we prayed my mother was not getting any better. Finally, my sisters from out of town came, and they said, we're taking her to the hospital, Doyle. And they did, and we come to find out my mother had a massive heart attack and was... Uh, was touch and go, did not know if she would live or die. And God did a, heal, did a healing work in her. My dad came back. He made amends with my mother. They remarried, and they continued their pastoral ministry, and that's what brought us here to Holland, Michigan, in fact. And um, I remember... Only later on, three years later, it's either two or three years later, um, after we'd moved to Holland, Michigan, I met Nancy here. We fell in love, and we decided, let's get married. I was 19 years old, and there's a little church over on Hazel, off 16th. We got married in that church. And we told you about this a few weeks ago when we were on vacation. We were with our best man and our matron of honor and at the church of the minister who married us. And we decided 
I actually recommended it. So if anybody doesn't think I'm a romantic, just know that I recommended this. I said, honey, why don't we renew our vows after 46 years? And it's on video. I was just looking at it this week, how we, we gave our vows again to one another with those five people that were there. And, um, but when I got married here 46, over 46 years ago, there in, um, right here in Holland, I didn't find out about this until later. But my mother told me later on, she said, Doyle, do you remember when I had that heart attack when you were a teenager? I said, of course. She said, it looked like God was going to take me home, Doyle. And she said, I prayed a prayer. This is perfect love that I'm talking about. She said, I prayed, God, don't take me yet. Let me at least get Doyle out of the house. Let me raise him so that he gets out on his own. I didn't know she said that. That day as we went to the back of the church after the ceremony, I'm standing back there, and I'm doing fine. I'm doing great. I'm smiling, enjoying the process. But when I seen my mother walking down the aisle toward us, I burst out into tears. Nancy asked me later, She said, why did you, why did you weep? She's thinking, oh, are you sad that you married me? You know? I said, no. I said, I don't know why, Nancy, but when I seen my mother, I was overwhelmed with emotion. We got, we went over to the reception, had a beautiful reception, thanks to Nancy's mom and dad over at the Beachwood Inn. We took off for our honeymoon. We spent our honeymoon night in Benton Harbor, Michigan, of all places. I've gotten better at planning since then. What I didn't know until a few years later is that my mother and dad were going back home to Hobart, Indiana. My mother had a sudden attack in her chest. And God spoke to her and said, Do you remember what you said to me? She knew exactly what he was talking about. If I could just get Doyle out on his own. And then the pain left. God reminded her of her commitment, of her agreement, her covenant, if you want to call it that. She didn't tell me about that for some time later, but here's the story. My mother lived another eight years. I was 19, when that happened, I was 27, almost, not quite, but almost eight years to the date. I wish I knew the date that my mother had her heart attack back in 1972 or 73, but I think it was, again, it was that very same time of the year that I was married three years later. I thought about that this weekend. I thought about the love of God. I thought about the love of a mother. Abraham Lincoln said this, and I believe this. Abraham Lincoln is the most revered president 
of all the 46 presidents that have ever lived. There's not a close second. If there is a second, it's probably Washington. As far as being beloved and respected, Abe Lincoln said this, no one is poor who has had a godly mother. And Abe Lincoln was raised dirt poor. Abe Lincoln also said later, he said, all that I am or ever hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. I can, I can say so much of that as well. I haven't accomplished not a tiny percentage of what Abraham Lincoln, but if I've established anything, if I've accomplished anything, I owe so much of it to my praying mother who prayed for me every day. She was an example of perfect love. And verse 18 says, when perfect love comes in, it expels fear and torment. And I'm going to be just as open and honest with you this morning as I can be. I spoke to this, I spoke to Nancy about this the other night as we were talking about this verse. And I said, honey... Fear and torment. I said, that's something that I've lived with my entire life. It was not something I even wanted to be transparent with her, let alone give this to the congregation. I said, honey, I've been fearful and tormented. She knows me very well, and she knows some of the reasons for that. I was raised in a denomination when I was only, shortly after I got saved, I took a covenant with a denomination. I didn't take a covenant at that time with Jesus. I took a covenant with the denomination as I just, even now at this age, I'm beginning to figure things out like that. I came into an agreement with the denomination that I would do all these things and I would, I would walk as perfectly as possible. I'd live a sanctified life, an unblemished life, a sinless life. And oh boy, I, did I ever give it my best tries. And there would be periods of time, long periods of time when I walked sinlessly. Remember one time when I was college age, There had to be at least a whole year. I said this once before a few years ago and got in trouble for saying this, but I don't care. It's the truth. I walked for over a year, Brother Roll, sinlessly. And I I would be so convicted. I'd be so fearful. I would be so condemned if I didn't walk perfectly before the Lord. And Nancy knew this. We got married in that denomination. And she said, Doyle, no wonder. She said, consider what you were taught. She said, no wonder you felt fearful and tormented. And it's something even until recent months that I'd wake up in the middle of the night almost in a cold sweat in fear. Why? Because I hadn't done enough. I could have done more. Why didn't I do more? Why didn't I give more? Why didn't I sacrifice more? And then because I didn't feel I'd done enough or been good enough, I would feel that not only the guilt and the condemnation, but then the fear would come in. Thinking, you're not going to make it, Doyle. You're going to be lost. God's going to take one look at you and say, to hell with you. Those mostly would happen in the middle of the night, the so-called witching hour. These last few months, I've been going through a process. And I began to see these scriptures in a more beautiful and a more perfect way. 
And I know a scripture that I've been quoting for many years now for my own sense of wellness is that scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, that we have not been given a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love and power and a sound mind. You can't say you have a sound mind if you are going through torment. There were times I was intimately acquainted with torment. Why? Because I wasn't good enough. I wasn't doing enough. Hebrews, let me get through this this morning. I don't have too much to go, but let me finish this. I said we were going to take our time and not hurry through prayer or anything. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 18 and 19. Another of those deep, deep scriptures says, For on the one hand, there is the annulling of the former commandment. Because why? Of its weakness, its unprofitableness. There is no profit in trying to adhere to the law in your own strength, as I was trying to do. And it says plainly, For the law made nothing perfect. The law can't make me perfect. But on the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. On the one hand, there is the law which makes nothing perfect, but on the other hand, there is a better hope that brings us into a right place with God. On the other hand, I'm so glad for the other hand, for that better hope. I spoke to this a few Sundays ago out of John 13, 34, and Jesus, right before he died, he said to his disciples, he says, a new command I give you, that as I have loved you, now you must love one another. The only command here, listen, this is the only thing you've really got to worry about. And you don't even have to worry about this. You just have to comply. And that is to love one another. He said, as I have unselfishly loved you, disciples, now love each other unselfishly. Unselfishly. Unjudgingly. Brother Don, come here a minute. I want you to know this is my friend. If you speak bad about him, you speak bad about me because he's my friend. This brother, and I call him a brother, since he came to our church that night several months ago on a very cold, wintry night, he had no place to go. He had no place to lay his head that night. He was hungry, and he saw a sign that we were going to have a meeting that night, and he hung around, and he came in. He sat down. I won't forget the time I walked in, and Cynthia said, this is Don West. He's homeless. She said, I think the police are coming to pick him up and to take him somewhere. That night, the police never came. And as we broke into prayer, I looked at Don. I said, Don, I'm Pastor Dora. Tell us about what's going on. And he did. He told us what his needs were. And I said, I promise you tonight, Don. I said, you will not be sleeping in an alleyway tonight. You're going to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. And we passed the plate around that night. And it was amazing how much money came in. Everybody wanted to participate in that. That night we took Don. We took him to a hotel. It was going to be several nights, six, seven, five, six, seven days before he could get into the city mission. We took him and we put him up in a hotel. We made sure he had food. We brought different people. We're bringing him clothes and love gifts and items and so on and food. 
until we could get him over there. And Don, since that time, I wish I could say, and I, I know you wish you could say that everything's been Pollyanna since, but nope. you've struggled since oh. then. Oh, yeah. He's fallen. Yep. He's fallen some too. But I want you to know, this is my brother. And if I can't love him, I can't love any of you either. You believe that, Don? I believe that. <laughs> I'm telling you, on Sunday mornings, if he has to walk several miles to get here in the rain, he'll be here. He'll be the, one of the first ones coming through the door. Thursday night, he's here. On work day yesterday, he got over. I think you walked here yesterday. Yep. Walked here yesterday, <laughs> several miles, so he could work for several hours. Yep. I tell you, don't mess with my brother. <laughs> this is my brother. Love you, man. I love you, too. Amen. I want to be in heaven with him someday. I'm not going to give up on Don. A new command I give to you as I have loved you. As I have unselfishly given myself to you and you haven't even seen the half of it. He is saying selfishly, selflessly love one another. Our standard perfection, our standard of perfection is not adherence to the law. But our standard in the body of Christ is the love of Christ. We are going to be judged not on how perfectly we adhered to the law. We will be judged according to how we loved one another. Matthew 19, 21 says, if you want to be perfect, Jesus said this to a young man. He says, I want to be perfect. He said, what about all the commandments? He said, I've done them all since I was a child. Jesus said finally to this young man, and he loved him. He said that he looked at him. And he loved him. He says, if you want to be perfect, go. Go. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Go, sell, give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. The man walked away from God that day, from Jesus, and because he was very wealthy and could not let go of his possessions. He said, if you want to be perfect, do this and you will be perfect. What does perfect mean? I looked it up. It's defined as whole. If you want to be whole, if you want to be complete, if you want to be a mature Christian, then do this thing and be selfless in it. And then Colossians chapter 1, verse 28 and 29, as I get to this point, it says, Him we preach, Paul is saying, Him, Jesus, we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. I hear people say, you can't be perfect. Then what is Paul talking about here? About presenting every man perfect before God? What was Jesus talking about when he said every, uh, when, he, when he told the young man, he said, if you want to be perfect, go and do this. And Paul said, to this end I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. This is what I do. James. James is probably my favorite book in the Bible. And he said, if any man does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. What is John talking about? 
What is James talking about? What is Jesus talking about in Paul? This perfection, why are they even bringing that up if it's not possible? And in the great love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13 and 10, the apostle Paul said this beautiful, memorable scripture. He says, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away with. Perfect. You know what he's talking about there. The whole chapter is talking about agape love. The love of God, when that comes in us, we shall be perfect. When we show unselfish love to each other, we show the world who we are. You want people to know you're a Christian? It's not what you say so much. It's not what you do so much. It's how you love others that identifies, do we love one another? And finally, Romans 13, 10 says, love does no harm to a, la- a neighbor. Love is the fulfillment of the law. You want to complete the law? You want to be perfect and mature in the law? There's only one thing, because a man walked up to Jesus one time, Brother Edward, and he said, Lord, what is the greatest commandment? The greatest commandment. And Jesus said, you shall love the Lord God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and power. And then Jesus added an an addendum to that, and he said, and love one another, even as you love yourself. These two are one, and upon these two, all of the commandments of the law hang on. In other words, if you miss those two things, you break the law, and there's no remedy for that except Jesus. Love each other. Speak well of one another. Read the 1 Corinthians 13 love chapter and see what love represents, what it's about.